let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Our God is a God of perfect timing. God moves according to His very best will for your life. And therefore, you and I need to accept God's timing. There are going to be instances in our life when things are difficult. And we're going to feel as though God has abandoned us. That is not the reality. God will not leave you nor forsake you if you are in a covenantal relationship with Him. But there will be periods of time that are difficult, but God moves according to His timing, according to His purposes to bring about the fulfillment of His will for your life. And therefore, what must we be? We must be steadfast, meaning this, persevere. If you were to ask me, what is the one word that I have for believers today, it would be perseverance. We need to endure in the things of God, realizing that there is coming a day of transformation, that this world is not going to continue in the same way. We are moving into a time of darkness, of, of wickedness, of hardships, of persecution, but the light is coming. And when I say light, I'm talking about a word that is related to the kingdom. There is going to be that wonderful kingdom revelation. And what we need to do until then is persevere. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and open it up to the book of of Luke in chapter 1. Now we have been focusing in for the most part on one family. At this time, simply a man and a woman, a priestly family, a man by the name of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Now they were faithful but they had not received the blessing of God. Why? They had no children, not even one. But God moves according to His truth at His time, and there was that proclamation that Elizabeth, this woman who was well advanced in her life, old, had moved past the time of fertility. But this revelation, <coughs> excuse me, from God, that this woman who was barren, that was the reality that she was going to conceive a son and we know that she did God is faithful to produce the outcome of his promises it's only a matter of time we've made mention of the fact that this child who's going to be born to Zachariah and Elizabeth is John the Baptist and he is going to go before him. Who's the him? We talked about this. It's Messiah. And now, in this account, we're going to turn for a moment to how God is continuously working. Take out your Bible and look with me to verse 26. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and verse 26. Now, we know something. After Elizabeth conceived she was pregnant but she hid herself for five months those five months have expired and now look at verse 26 it says but in the sixth month now what sixth month are we talking about well the way that this is recorded we're talking about the sixth month within the Jewish calendar. So it's in the sixth month, which also happens to be Elizabeth's sixth month of pregnancy. But in this context, when we look at it grammatically, it is not in regard to Elizabeth. It is in regard to the sixth month on the Jewish calendar, the biblical calendar. And why is that important? Because this month, the sixth month, is the month that is set aside in a unique way for repentance. What is that? Turning to God. 
and we see that Messiah, he was conceived in the sixth month. We'll talk about more of that in a moment. He was conceived in the sixth month. Why? What was his purpose? To turn people to God. For this reason, he was brought into the world. So look once more at verse 26. But in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, this same angel, the angel Gabriel was sent by God into a city of Galilee. Now this is important. Because we're going to be told in a moment what city we're speaking of. We're speaking, of course, of Nazareth. But what's mentioned first? Galilee. Why? There's two reasons. First of all, I've shared with you before, whenever Galilee is mentioned in the Scripture, this term Galilee comes from a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew name, Galilee. It comes from a word which means to reveal. Now, some will say, well, be careful. It means to, to unroll, like to unroll a scroll. This is true. But when you unroll the scroll, you can read and there's revelation. So when Galilee appears in the Bible, it talks about a time, something of revealing. And this is what God's doing. He is revealing this one he spoke of as him previously. Who's the him? It is Messiah. Verse 26. But in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God into the village or into a city of Galilee. And this city was named Nazareth. Now, Nazareth comes from a Hebrew word which means to guard or to keep. It is a word that speaks of God keeping and guarding his promises that he made to humanity. And he was sent, this angel Gabriel was sent to that city in the Galilee, Nazareth. And it says, to a virgin who was engaged, having been engaged to a man by the name of Joseph. And notice it says, Joseph was of the household of David. David, what should we think about? God made a covenant with David. And that covenant would be that he would have a son, meaning a descendant. And that descendant would sit upon his throne, the throne of David, forever. In other words, this is all messianic. This is all speaking of the Messiah. And another word for Messiah, Messiah is the Hebrew word, Mashiach for the anointed one. In Greek, the anointed one is Christos, where we get the word Christ. So whether you say Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, or Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, we're speaking about the same one. This is the focus of this passage. And notice, this woman was betrothed. She was engaged. And what is she called? A virgin. Very soon, there's going to be released upon all of our platforms a special message dealing with the virgin birth. And believe this, this woman, Miriam, or Mary as she's frequently called in English, was a virgin. We'll talk more about that word and its significance in that special message. But it's clear here in the Greek language. Now some people will say, and they're wrong, When we look, for example, at Isaiah chapter 7, when it has that word virgin, it's the word Alma. And they'll say that just means a young woman. It does not. That is not what it means at all. There is a specific meaning to this word Alma, which means a recognized, a certified virgin. So look at that message, and you'll get more information. But it says here that he was sent to a virgin being betrothed she was engaged to a man by the name of Yosef from the house of David and the name of this virgin was what Miriam now this is important because this helps us to understand something why well also in the book of Exodus we know that the sister of Moses is also called a 
Alma, a virgin. And God used her in order for her brother to be preserved. Remember, she was the one that put him in the, the ark. You say, wait, it's a basket. Yes, but that word is the same word for that ark like in Noah's ark. The word of God is so marvelous. So Moses was put into that ark, that basket, so Pharaoh's daughter could find him. And this all had to do with the God's redemptive work. So now we see Yosef being of the household of David, that kingdom promise, <laughs> excuse me, of Messiah. And now we see Miriam, that name that relates to God preserving Moses to bring about redemption, that Old Testament redemption. Look now to verse 28. And the angel, having entered to her, said, Rejoice, O gracious one, for the Lord is with you. Now, it uses a verb that is related to grace. And we see something. Nothing in the scripture is written down by chance. It says here that she is a woman of grace. And what does grace bring about? Well, just keep reading. The Lord is with you. Through the grace of God, one can experience God. Have that relationship with him. And he says, blessed are you among women. Verse 29. But when she saw, saw this angel Gabriel, likewise, just like we saw with, with uh, um, Zachariah in the holy place, she was troubled at his word and she thought thoroughly that's what the word is she thought thoroughly on what manner of greeting <coughs> this was verse 30 <coughs> and the angel said to her do not fear miriam for you have found grace from God over and over what we see here is God's grace is at work and all of this has to do with the announcement of Messiah that he is going to be conceived in a supernatural way in order that a virgin would become pregnant and bear this child who would become the redeemer of the world realize something when we speak of the virgin birth, it is not the origin of Messiah. Messiah is the eternal Son of God. There was never a time that Messiah did not exist. Messiah was not created. To think of Messiah being created is heresy. He is eternal. This only speaks of the incarnation how the Son of God, who is eternal God, how he took on human flesh in order to do the work of redemption. And over and over, we're talking about, and this is why initially a priestly family was, was mentioned, a priest, a mediator between man and God, and we're going to see that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is that perfect mediator who is going to bring about eternal redemption between man so that man can be eternally with God in his kingdom. So she's pondering what greeting that he said to her. And verse 30, And the angel said, Do not fear, Miriam, for you have found grace from God. Verse 31, And behold, you shall conceive in the womb and you shall bear a son. So she is well, this virgin, she is going to conceive <laughs> and bear a son. And you shall call his name Yeshua. Now this name Yeshua means Savior. It relates to salvation, but it speaks, specifically speaks of him being the Savior. 
and this is what the Redeemer does. This term Savior is a synonym for the concept of Redeemer. So what God is saying is this, Mary, you are going to conceive supernaturally. You are a virgin, but nevertheless, God is going to speak, and we're going to see by means of the Holy Spirit, a child's going to be supernaturally, miraculously conceived in your womb. And this one is going to be called Yeshua. Why? Well, Jesus is simply the English term for the Hebrew word Yeshua, which speaks of a Savior. He is going to bring salvation into this world. Verse 32. Now, this is a small issue. Yochanan, if this is a small issue, but it has some great importance. What it says here is, this one will be great. Now, most of the time, what we see is it translated as, he will be great. And that's fine. But a different word is used. It is not the word he, but it's the word this one. Why? When the term this one is used rather than he, it emphasizes it. It's a word that causes greater attention, a greater emphasis to be placed upon this one. So I looked at 27 different translations and I only found one that got it right, that translated it literally where it says, this one will be great, also the son of the most high he shall be, he shall be called. Now, this is all speaking of the fact that it's pointing to his divinity. Learn something. The virgin birth speaks to the divinity of Messiah. That's why it says he will be the son of the Most High. This speaks about the divinity that God is doing the work of redemption. That God took on human flesh in order to do the work so that we could experience salvation. Verse, verse 32, the second part. And the Lord God will give to him, give to Yeshua, the throne of David, his father. Again, just putting this into terms so we know that this is the fulfillment of what we see in 2 Samuel, this Davidic covenant that God made with David concerning the promise of the Messiah. The son of David is another term for Messiah. And we see over and over that Yeshua is the one who fulfills that covenant that God made with David. Verse 33. And he shall rule over the house of Jacob. Now, again, we have to ask ourselves, why is the term Jacob there? Well, if you know Hebrew, the term Jacob means to follow after, to pursue. This is what Jacob was doing in the womb when he was hanging on to the heel of his evil brother, Asaph. He wanted to pull him back because he wanted to be the firstborn. He was the one interested in the call of God. That covenant promise, that's what Jacob was, was, was committed to. And this is why it says, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever and ever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. It speaks of eternity. Why? Because God's offering eternal redemption. Not something that is limited, not something that's going to wear out, not something that is going to expire, but his kingdom there will be no end, meaning that it transcends and this concept of transcending relates to the very nature and character of God. That's the kingdom that we are being invited into, verse 34. But Miriam said to the angel, how will this be since a man I do not know. What does she mean? I have never experienced this intimacy with a man. 
Now, obviously, to conceive and to give birth requires a father, requires that male seed. And she's saying, I have never known a man. This all attests to the fact, indeed, she is a virgin. And she remained a virgin even after Joseph, and we'll see this, took her to himself. But the scripture says, he never knew her. He never had any physical relationship with her in that regard until after the birth of Messiah. Read again verse 34. But Miriam, that is Mary, said to the angel, How will this be since a man I do not know? Verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, Here's how it's going to come about. The Holy Spirit, he will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also, you will give birth from, you will give birth and it says that this one is going to be holy and he will be called the Son of God. So all of this is the outcome of the work of the Holy Spirit. And notice that it says clearly here, this one is holy, meaning he's set apart for a purpose. That's what holiness is. And we see as well that he's going to be called the Son of God. This term, Son of God, speaks clearly once more of the divinity. Now, all of this because the Holy Spirit is the source, the Spirit of God. This also speaks to his divinity. Verse 36. And behold, in order to, to confirm, and here again, Miriam, she's struggling with this. Pretty powerful words to hear. Being a young woman, he says, Behold, Elizabeth, your relative, and she has conceived a son when? in her old age this one it says she is in her sixth month now we're talking again this sixth month of of elizabeth is also the sixth month on the calendar she is also in her sixth month the one who was called barren what god is saying is this if god can make a barren woman who's old long past the time of fertility to conceived and be pregnant and she has revealed this five months she concealed herself but now beginning in the sixth month she came out and people could see that she was no longer barren what did we talk about last week that God had removed the disgrace her disgrace among people that God had blessed her and what this is all for is to teach Miriam that in the same way that God did a miraculous conception for an old woman, he can also cause a young woman, a virgin either, one who had never known a man, to also conceive. Verse 37. Because, and this is what you need to realize, because there is not an impossibility from God all word. Now, I translated that literally. What it means is this. There is nothing impossible with God. And then it says, every word. This is the term in Hebrew, Greek, rima. It's a word of proclamation. What it's saying is this. Everything that God proclaims, not what I decree. My decree is empty. My decree is without power. Don't listen to people say, I decree this. No, they don't. They have no power. This is pride that brings someone to do this. No, we agree with God. We read scripture. What God decrees, we can believe. But what it says here is that every proclamation of God is going to be fulfilled. Nothing is impossible for God. Verse 38 our last verse and Mary said behold the servant of the Lord now it's in the feminine so we might translate it a maid servant 
So she is saying, I am your servant. I am committed to this. I want to be used in this way. It's a term of submissiveness and something else. She's agreeing with God. That is such a wise thing. If you were to ask me, what is the most wise thing a person can do? Simply agree with God's word. What God says, believe it. So she says, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And we find that the angel departed from her. When she says yes to God, what happens? That angel goes back before God. All of this is to tell us is that God is going to go to work to bring this promise about. Of the forerunner, who's the forerunner? Yochanan Hamadbil, John the Baptist. This has already began how much earlier? Six months prior. We see that this has been set in motion. And now the one that's going to come after, who is the main one, Messiah, his conception has already happened that she has conceived him in her womb by means of the Holy Spirit. This one who's going to have a kingdom, remember that. The emphasis is upon the kingdom. Why? Because that term Messiah means king, anointed one, but it's the anointed king. All of this is being set out before us in order that we understand the purposes of God. And God's purposes are fulfilled miraculously. Realize that, believe that, expect that. God, when you are submitting to him, God, when you are believing his word, God will move mightily. And this account that gives the foundation for understanding the gospel speaks to a God who is able to do all things, all things according to his proclamation. Well, I'll close with that until next time. Be blessed by believing the word of God, agreeing with him. There's nothing wiser that you can